Hello class, this is Professor Dwight Hughes for Intech 224, Cisco CCNA Connecting Networks. Today we're going to cover Chapter 2, Connecting to the WAN. We'll cover some basic WAN technologies and criteria to look at when selecting a WAN technology. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the purpose of the WAN, describe WAN operations, WAN services that are available, compare various private WAN technologies, compare various public WAN technologies, and know basic criteria for appropriate choices of a WAN protocol and technology for a specific requirement. Let's look at WAN technologies in general. Why choose a WAN? Okay, well, we need a WAN when we need to operate beyond the geographic scope of the LAN. A LAN exists within a building or a room or a campus. So if you had a closely clustered group of buildings, that would be a LAN, and it could use a technology like Ethernet, typically wires you run yourself, maintain yourself, even wireless and other technologies in the LAN. In the WAN, we might be going miles, kilometers, even all the way around the world. They're used to interconnect these different offices and locations. Sometimes we have remote users and telecommuters that are at their home or even mobily uh, moving between uh, like a cafe or a, um, another place where they might get public Wi-Fi. They're typically the WAN links are owned by a service provider, an internet service provider, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, um, T-Mobile, that kind of thing. And usually you have to pay a fee for the use of the services. So you usually pay a fixed monthly fee per location and then you pay a usage fee based on the bandwidth you consume. Are WANs necessary? Well, WANs are our best way to interconnect our multiple locations. Sometimes we can make these connections a little more cost effective if we want to use the public internet. But we give up some things over the private WAN. We'll be looking at the difference between public and private WANs. If they're private, then we get to pay for everything that we want to expect from it, much like you do on your cell phone. And if they're public, they're much like the internet. It can be slow, it can be fast, that kind of thing. So businesses do require that they be interconnected so that we can move data quickly between the different locations so that the network can appear to be a seamless uh, network where your data and information is available throughout. Networks have evolved. Companies expect their networks to perform optimally all the time now because more and more businesses rely on the internet and networks to be able to stay in business. So in this chapter, it uses a fictitious company, Span Engineering, an environmental consulting firm. And it talks about the company laying out kind of a, a rationale for what the company is and what they do and their need for these WAN connections. So five years on, the company has grown tremendously. And you get in the labs in this chapter, you get to help Span Engineering upgrade their WAN connections and make some choices that will fit their new evolved network. Small office campus network, right? So if you had a small office, it would have a few employees. And uh, remember last chapter uh, in my lecture, I described a Cisco small office is defined as one to 200 devices. So sometimes a small office is not that small. And then we have the campus network, which is uh, considered an enterprise a network or large network, which is typically a thousand or more devices. So when we connect that small office, we're gonna use a different type of connection than we are in a large office. So some of the things that we might use in a small office would be what we call broadband, things like DSL or cable, even cellular. Branch networks. A branch network's kind of in the middle, right? We've got the really large uh, enterprise networks, the really small, small networks, or sometimes called SOHO, small office, home office. And in the middle, we have the branch networks, which are the medium-sized network. It might look something like this. We create a WAN, as shown in the cloud in the center of the diagram, to interconnect our remote offices with branch and central offices. 
we want to look at a distributed network where the different sites have more than one path to travel to get across the network. And we have the files distributed and the workload distributed around that network. Of course, you can kind of read the talking points here on network design. Here's a look then at a distributed network. Again, here the internet is being used as the interconnect for all the different locations. Typically, WANs operate at the bottom two layers of the OSI model. So that would be the physical and the data link layer. So you'd be looking at protocols like HDLC, PPP, Frame Relay, sometimes even Ethernet. MPLS is one of the new exciting protocols that is being offered in uh, large cities around the world today. At the physical layer, uh, typically we have various uh, optical um, carrier signals. We still use some copper wire um, technologies and uh, more and more there are wireless solutions. WAN devices. So normally your router is going to connect to a WAN device sometimes called a modem or a CSU DSU. You can see in the upper right corner of this diagram a router connected to a CSU DSU and in the upper left modems. And there's other types. There's cable modems and DSL modems and you see them all in this diagram. So we are of course not limited to one single WAN technology and a company may utilize different ones in different areas for connectivity. For instance, in a large city, I may be able to purchase different types of WAN circuits than I can in a small rural area. One thing to keep in mind with older WAN technologies is they were circuit switched. Circuit switch technologies typically have very little bandwidth, but the bandwidth is dedicated. So if, for instance, you made a dial-up connection on a modem, you would have always essentially the same bandwidth through that connection. It's usually about 34 to 64 kilobits per second. Packet switching is the new way that we do WANs. And packet switching is the way Ethernet works. We send small packets and they take different paths through the network. Let me go back to circuit switching. We're still sending packets, but they're all traveling the exact same path. So there's no routing involved. A circuit is built from end to end and the packets all follow the same path. So if there was an outage or congestion, they, 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 they wouldn't route around it. They would continue to take the same path. Whichever path the first packet travels, all the others will follow. And that's called circuit switching. Packet switching is reading the to and from information on each packet as it travels through the device and making a choice at that point in time on the best path for that packet. So two or three packets may not take the same path through the network to get to the same destination. Selecting a WAN technology. So typically WANs break down into two broad categories, private WAN and public WAN. Of course, public we mean the internet. Private, private breaks into two subcategories. We can have dedicated or switched. A dedicated would be an example of a T1. It means that you're purchasing the literally the physical wires from point A to point B. It's always there for you. If you're not talking on it, the bandwidth is wasted. It just sits there unutilized. It's your bandwidth, it's your wires. They go from point A to point B. They're for your exclusive use. This is obviously the most expensive would be a dedicated private WAN. A switched private WAN allows you to share unused um, capacity with other users on the network and therefore realize a cost savings. So you can get the same bandwidth for less money essentially in a switched private WAN. There are two types of switched private WANs, circuit and packet. We looked at those in the prior slides. The older technologies are circuit switched and the newer ones are packet switched. Packet switched usually um, improves performance. So we get a better performance out of a packet switch network where circuit switching is the old way of doing things 
and it's uh, a little bit limited in terms of its uh, ability to deal with congestion and other issues on the network. It's just another diagram that illustrates that you don't use one WAN technology from end to end. You might have to hodgepodge to gather a whole bunch of different technologies at your different locations, depending on what's available and the size of the location and what they need. So here we've got leased lines, satellite, regular dial-up, uh, you know, you name it, cable, DSL, all, all interconnecting. So you literally hopefully get the idea that you could dial up on a dial-up modem and connect to someone else's T1 or satellite. And the internet, um, or the ISP in this case, has routers connected to all these various technologies to allow the signal to move from one to the other. A leased line, again, is a private network that is very expensive. And it has limited flexibility. You have to wait weeks or months for them to hook it up. And it can't be um, rerouted easily because it is literally physically cabled from point A to point B. Of course, the advantages, it's always available because it's yours exclusively. Um, it's always high quality. So if they tell you it's 1.5 megabits per second, it's always exactly that. It's also very simple and secure. Dial up. Ah. I'm not sure there's even advantages. Um, I guess one is availability and low cost. So you can usually find a phone line pretty much anywhere, although that is slowly changing today. Um, that was a big advantage of, of dial-ups. I'm not sure it's so simple. It had a lot of complications. It's uh, not always reliable, um, but it is cheap to implement. Disadvantages, of course, it's low speed, uh, it takes a very long time to connect. It can uh, spontaneously disconnect, and uh, there's reliability issues with it. ISDN is a digital phone line. So unlike dial-up, which was putting an analog tone-based signal on a phone line that we use for human voice, ISDN is a packet-based circuit technology. So they send packets over circuits called bearer channels and delta channels. And you can see there's always one delta channel that carries your signaling and the bearer channels carry your packets. So in an ISDN BRI called the basic rate interface, you get two 64 kilobit bearer channels. In a ISDN PRI, you get 24 channels. 23 of them are bearer channels. If you were in Europe, called the E1, you would get 30 bearer channels. Of course, we're not in Europe, so in America, we have the T1, which gives us 23 64 kilobit per second bearer channels. So you can do the math on that. But that's ISDN technology. It was developed in the 1970s and it's still around today, still used heavily by businesses big and small, because it's widely deployed. You can get to it in many areas. Frame Relay, another 1970s technology that's slowly, well, maybe fastly going away. Frame Relay is being replaced by um, other protocols like MPLS. But Frame Relay, in a global sense, is still out there in many countries around the world. Also in rural areas, Frame Relay may be your go-to technology. This is a circuit switching technology. ATM, another older technology. This is really from the 80s, so it moved up a decade. In the 1980s, we come out with ATM, which is a packet switch technology. And it was designed for voice, video, and data. So it's designed for converged networks. In fact, many ISPs continue to use APM, ATM internally within their own network, but they rarely sell it to customers any longer. But they use the ATM switches they used to use in the 80s. They now keep them around and use them internally to move traffic in, inside their networks. Ether, <coughs> Ethernet, sometimes called MetroNet or MPLS, is um, pushing Ethernet out of the LAN and using it within a metropolitan WAN.
MPLS, perhaps the coolest new technology out there, can interconnect to any of the other technologies and encapsulate them within it. So in this diagram, you can see different endpoints running on T1s, T3s, uh, Ethernet, and Frame Relay, and they are all plugged into an MPLS cloud. So MPLS can frame and reframe all of those technologies and interconnect them. Satellite. Oh, we use satellite, especially in rural areas. We use satellite when we have disasters, like when there were the floods, uh, the Katrina floods. Um, they brought in, ISPs brought in uh, diesel-powered satellite dishes to be able to uplink their phone and telecommunications. So we do use satellites still. Uh, Hughes is a large satellite provider. It's expensive and it has long delays. But when you need it, it may be the only way if you're... Uh, um, either in a mobile situation or you are in a rural area, you might need satellite. DSL, uh, this is a 1990s uh, technology and it um, it is also going away. But DSL is widely deployed, so you can usually find it in most areas and it provides a, a decent amount of bandwidth um, to connect or interconnect your WAN location. Cable, again, uh, uh, technology that's getting better and better. Cable uh, is fastly replacing uh, DSL in many areas. The speeds keep going up, um, and you get some pretty good, uh, pretty good connectivity. It has its uh, downsides. It is shared bandwidth up and down your street, so the bandwidth can uh, fluctuate up and down dramatically uh, throughout the day. So many companies don't like cable because they don't like that unknown of the bandwidth kind of ebbing and flowing. Wireless, boy, this is a really hot area, is um, wireless WAN. So a lot of wireless technologies, like we mentioned satellite, but also WiMAX and municipal Wi-Fi uh, technologies and cell other cellular technologies. WiMAX is a form of cellular technology. Okay. Many of you may have the 4G LTE or you've heard of 3G or the older 4G technologies, uh, you can actually get a cellular modem and uh, plug it right into a computer or router or a server, and these might work for smaller, um, smaller network locations. VPN technology. Right, so the nice thing with the VPN is it gives you a secure, cost-effective connection between locations across the internet. So it allows you to essentially encrypt your site-to-site -site or remote site traffic. So to choose the right type of WAN connection, you need to, one, know the purpose of the WAN. Why do you need a WAN? What's it for? Is it interconnecting two static locations? Is it allowing a remote user to connect from home or a mobile user to connect from the field? What's the geographic scope? Are you making these connections within a single city or are you going hundreds of miles or even around the world. What are the traffic requirements? What type of application data? How much traffic or bandwidth do you need, right? Is this low bandwidth, high bandwidth? Is it spiky or pretty consistent uh, traffic? Do you send traffic all day, every day? Um, is the traffic delay tolerant? If you didn't have enough bandwidth, would the traffic wait around until you did? Or is it like voice and video that really need to move quickly across the network? So you have to really understand the applications and the traffic to be able to choose the correct WAN solution. This is some of those uh, questions listed here for you. So in summary, a business can use private lines or the public internet to interconnect their locations. WAN access standards typically operate at layers one and two of the OSI model. A WAN may be circuit or packet switched. There is common terminology used to identify the physical components of WAN connections. That helps you when you're talking to various service providers or customers. Service provider networks are complex and the service provider's backbone networks consist primarily of high bandwidth fiber optic media. Permanent, dedicated point-to-point -point connections are provided by leased lines. Public infrastructure connections, DSL, cable, wireless, cellular. Security over public connections can be provided using encryption or VPNs. 